If you're joining us today for the first time, this is part seven of a multi-part series designed to help introduce and discuss the source material for the HBO show Watchmen. If you're unfamiliar with the story or like to start from the beginning, you may want to see our episode on issue one. everybody welcome to sam and scott are watching watchmen the show where we watch the hbo show watchmen i'm scott and i'm S- oh okay i'm sam he is sam and i checked <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so welcome <laughs> welcome to the show today uh super glad to be joining you today uh sam how you doing hey what's going on with you buddy oh uh, you know just uh <laughs> really Really feeling super confident and not awkward at all after reading Chapter 7. Oh, not, uh, not, not at all there. <laughs> none. There will be no giggle. There's not going to be any points in today's show where I'm just going to devolve into a puddle of giggles, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll take care be of that totally, for you, buddy. Yeah, right? I mean, oh, goodness gracious. All right, well, before we <laughs> jump into the fun part, Let me stop, let's, let's get, let's oh, get some housekeeping If you want to send feedback on uh, how I laugh, hashtag hate Sam. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to send some feedback on how pretentious i am hate scott hashtag hate scott tell you want to do that yes but you can also send us feedback by emailing uh watching watchmen at nerdcyclopedia.com mm-hmm. and you can also check out our twitter which is at watchmen podcast one that's right <laughs> at watchmen podcast one they refuse to give us the t and uh, scott 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 Please tell them the real story. We cannot afford the tea at this moment. <laughs> hey, you know, I mean, that is listen, the real the, story. We don't have to get into how the business is going. That's, <laughs> a, that's not for the show. That's for <laughs> yeah. We couldn't afford the tea. They tried to auction off the tea, and we can only, you know, you start uh, you start with zero, and uh, every every increment toward tea alphabetically costs a little more. So we we did spring for the one. Yeah, we could not. So that's really guys, so you know, we'll get it one day. Maybe. That's right. <laughs> I mean, maybe we will. Who knows? Anyway, so <laughs> so that's how to get in touch with us. Uh, we also got some real exciting news about an upcoming event. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. So we got the Steel City Con coming up in April, April 12th through the 14th. Come down to see us if you're in town. Um, we will have a booth. Um, you know, or actually, I'm sorry, we'll have a table. You know, table. You know, you will be um doing a marathon podcast. I hope you're ready. From oh yeah, 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 and you can even possibly guest star if you like. So you know, come down, shake hands, and you know, see us in person live. You know, you know, and I know. Don't get too scared. <laughs> Experience the terror of finding out what your podcast personalities look like. Are our voices what you thought they mm-hmm. were, corresponding to how we look? Who cares? It doesn't really matter. So so it's at the uh, um, Moroville um, uh, Convention Center, you know, in um, Pittsburgh, it's in Moroville. Um, yeah. yeah, like I said, April twelfth through the fourteenth, if, if you're in town. So come on down. We will be auctioning off advertising time uh, as we <laughs> usually do uh, for our Encyclopedia podcast. We're seeing if anyone can beat the two fifty we got for the last cycle. We got uh, that's that two dollars. Two dollars and fifty cents uh, that I cannot access. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, we're going to be handing stuff out. It'll be real exciting to see everybody uh, come on in. We're going to be uh, you know collecting some feedback, general questions about the show to be used on later casts. So yeah, you know, stop by. Uh, you know, who knows what's going to be going on over at that table, uh, other than twenty six delicious Nerd Encyclopedia podcasts, which I think we'll be getting done. Scrumptious, nummy nummy. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> So that's just sort of the housekeeping. Um, I don't really have much uh, from uh, the wife today because she has been very busy and has not had a chance to catch up yet. Mm, okay. um, I will say this. After I talked to her, I told her what we, what we talked about last week uh, as far as what she said. and, and uh, Or that's what she said, which is our uh, – <laughs> that's what we're going to start calling that uh, <laughs> That's that what segment. she said. That's, that's what, what she said. Yeah, all right. Uh, like so she, she said what she notices is that there's like – and everywhere in this story, there's this like this lack of empathy. There's like an empathy well, you know what I mean? Where there's nothing. So like, what's missing from you know when when she's talking about lack of em- empathy, is she talking about um just uh, well lack of empathy? It's just non caring and everything. But is it overall depression that she's just getting from like a lot of these characters who just I think, don't give I a think... crap? I think that's it. I think what she's saying is like the world, it seems just a lot hard, much harder. And like when you think about Hollis, mm-hmm. 
<clears throat> like when Hollis came to super heroing adventuring, uh-huh. you know, he came, he started from a place of empathy. Like his story begins with that, the saddest thing I've ever heard, which is flight of the Valkyries. Right. Uh-huh. It's all about how, how that, you know, it's a, uh, the guy that owned that station, you know, lost his mind and killed himself, and it was sad for him, and he wanted to stop bad things from happening. Right, right. right. And then you look at the origin, you know, the origin stories of the rest of the, the second generation of these characters, and I mean, Rorschach, there's no empathy in Rorschach's story anywhere. Right, None. He just wants to punish. He's a he's a scourge, you know, <laughs> to be used. Uh, I think what you'll find today, we're going to talk a little bit about Night Out Two, mm-hmm. and uh, you know that it's a nice when we talk about his origin, we'll talk about you know you, you'll notice there's not really any empathy. You know what I mean? It's not a. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, he, he's very. You know, there's a lot of selfishness, and it feels to me like when you think about about Superman or Batman or, or Spider Man specifically, is who I was thinking about with this. Okay. There's a lot of this, you know, like empathetic sticking up for the little guy. That sort of thing is prevalent throughout those stories, but this, these Silver Era heroes don't have any of that. Yeah, they're um, selfish. You know, it's a lot of optimism, especially among you know the modern Golden Age ones. Um, you know, a lot of optimism, you know, things are going to be great at the end and, you know, the bad mm-hmm. guys will get defeated and, you know, the good guys will win. Yeah. And everyone we've talked about so far. So like, you know, the motivations for becoming a hero aren't, you know, it, do, it doesn't seem like the motivations are to help people really. It's to, <laughs> you know, uh, either because for profit, which is, I guess, Lori's motivation, right? Cause she was pushed toward this by her mother who was, right. you know, able to monetize her. <laughs> Her status as a superhero Mm -hmm. or obsession, Mm -hmm. which is Rorschach's just obsessed with punishment and dealing out, meeting out retributive justice. Right. And and what we'll find today, as we talk about, you know, Dan Dryberg, is Dan's driving, (laughs) the driving force behind Dan's uh, super adventuring is a combination of of like laziness, of like boredom. I don't want to say laziness because he obviously does work. Right. So it's like he's bored Mm -hmm. and he's also fetishistic. (laughs) <laughs> like there's a combination of those two things that right. make him put the put the mask on, right? Yeah, right. right. Uh, which is so so interesting to think about that now that we're we're getting to this point uh, in the story, and you, you kind of you know I flash back to that that scene in the second chapter mm-hmm. uh, where he's telling uh, where he's lamenting the, the American dream, right? Right. Like what happened to the American dream? And he says, uh, the comedian says, you're looking at it. And it's so it's so interesting to think of Dan, you know, at that point in the story, you think of Dan as sort of a wholesome character, and he's not. Well, it's sort you know, of like um, two sides of a coin, especially when comedian, you know, is telling him about that. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. Dan is, um, if you want to call it naively thinking, you know, things are one way, and the comedian is looking at the other side, okay, this is reality. You know, mm-hmm. um, um, Dan's on one side of that, and the comedian is standing on the other side. You know, and mm-hmm. the comedian has the well. Dan has the fortune of having a comedian show him exactly how the world is. You know, at mm-hmm. that point. So yeah, great, great. Two sides of the uh, of a uh, of the same coin. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And you know, the comedian seems to just—it's almost like a morality. Like if everything's going to burn, we might, I might as well have a good time. And he just likes to hurt people. Right. That's what I get out of the comedian. Yeah. Honestly. Well, that's his, his his sense of selfishness right there. So yeah, he's pleasuring himself in that aspect. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, Bob, we're not going Scarmucci on this. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I just watched Celebrity Big Brother. I mean, I don't want to timestamp this, but he was on that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, okay, so um. So without further ado, mm-hmm. uh, the wonderfully awkward chapter seven, oh, uh, chapter seven, which is uh, entitled "A Brother to Dragons," right? Is that what it is? Yep. A brother, a brother to dragons. dragons. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so chapter seven starts out with the, the cover, which is uh, Dan's dusty goggle. Yeah. And what is dust? Well, <laughs> <laughs> let's off, delve into that a little bit. You know, off, off my it's called I, deconstruction, I Scott. Breaking off mic, I jokingly, uh, <laughs> I jokingly told Sam, like, I hope you're ready to talk about what dust is, because uh, that's the first thing we're going to talk about. <laughs> so so Lori's poking around in Dan's basement, and he's got all this this dusty sort of tech everywhere, from his suit, with the goggle, um, to his, you know, Arche, Arche his, uh, his ship. Archimedes. Absolutely. Is that, is that how you pronounce Archimedes? It's Archimedes, I think, Archimedes, is how you okay. pronounce it. Right. The original... Char- the original um, Archimedes is how you pronounce the original uh, Syracusean scientist's name. Oh, right. I don't know if he calls it Archie or Archie or what. I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I would call it Archie, but I guess Archie makes more sense. 
you know, uh, I, 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 a pronunciation is something that's always bothered me from conversion from, from the written work, and I don't know why I care that much, but I do. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a it's a it's a thing, and you know, you you want to do your best to get it right and everything, but you know, it's written work. So until you actually Absolutely. hear someone say it, <laughs> or the or, or the creator <laughs> say it, then you know, right. you have to interpret, you know, um, or assume it's what it is. But let's compliment. First of all, again, the storytelling on this first page and a half and everything mm-hmm. okay. told in Absolutely. silence, all in panels. You know, Lori is sl- is just looking. You know, she 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 wipes off the dust and everything off the um off off the mask. Notice it hasn't been worn in a while. You know, hence mm-hmm. the dust. Um, and is looking around. She's just pretty much just in amazement and you know of everything that she sees in the technology that. You know that 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 um, night I would kept Dan Dryberg kept, and it's just going around to the things, just reminiscing um, of the ship. <laughs> it's a wonderment, yep. you know. This is an actual superhero ship, you know, or a mass, you know, adventurer ship and everything. And she's just she's just in amazement that, um, well, at least when I'm interpreting that she was ever involved in anything like this, you know, that um, yep. that this technology is there. And then finally, you know, she tries to light a cigarette with the ball thing in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> the weird, the weird cigarette. And it's, like it's about to, 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 yeah, exactly. Right. You know, and it's about to destroy everything <laughs> by pressing the wrong yeah, right? button. But yeah, um, she, tried, she thinks it's a cigarette lighter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it just also it just goes to show you how um, great the storytelling is in no words uh, within mm-hmm. these you know this first page and a half. Absolutely, and we're we're treated to uh, you know the, these uh, these views of all this dust being wiped away, right? Mm-hmm. And what is dust? Well, dust is. I <laughs> know, right? Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, so, so dust is an accumulation of. Uh, it accumulates over time. It accretes. It's a lot of skin cells, and it's a lot of like other sort of debris, and it sort of f- covers everything. And as you see here, if you look at what she's wiping off, all right, what's she wiping off? She's wiping off Dan's goggles, right? She's wiping off the viewport on Archimedes. So she's taking away that sort of dust that obscures your vision. All right. That dust of time, a time will obscure your vision, which is a lot like what her mother was saying in chapter two. Great, great. Uh, everything great. looks grimy now, mm-hmm. but the past looks bright. Mm-hmm. Aha. Mm-hmm. Get it, guys. Mm-hmm. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so that's kind of what she's doing. She's down here seeing, you know, she's checking, looking at her finger. And then, yeah, she she goes to light her crack pipe. Uh, which I, I, we're to, I mean, we're to understand his cigarettes. I'm not trying to uh, insinuate anything there. And it's a flamethrower. So she she lights it, uh, Dan's whole like basement on fire. Mm-hmm. And she screams uh, as she does it, which alarms Dan. So he's upstairs refilling the sugar cubes. Those belasted sugar cubes. <laughs> the uh, sugar cubes. And thinking about Rorschach because you see Rorschach in her cutting here with his previous visit, Mm -hmm. and he's remembering, oh, yeah, there's a mass killer out there. So he comes running down the stairs, and he he yells, Lori, and she's trying to put the fire out because she's uh, foolishly lit lit everything everything on fire. (laughs) Burn it all. Uh, Burn it all. (laughs) So if you really think about it, uh, she has reached into Dan's innermost sanctum Mm -hmm. and lit a flame (laughs) under his kitchen. You know what I'm saying? Wink, wink. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Mm-hmm. She sparked something deep within his sanctum. And now a part of his life that he thought was over is now fully illuminated. Oh, man. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop that. He's going to so, get illuminated, all right, boy. Absolutely. So he's going to get lit up. <laughs> so so Dan says, uh, hey, you know, so they put the fire out, and Dan says, oh, there was a, I was concerned the mask killer came back. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lori immediately says, oh, come on, Dan, you're, not, you're, you're starting to talk like Rorschach. You're starting to take Rorschach's mass killer bullshit seriously. Right. <laughs> Which I think is just funny. Right. I just think that's funny. What she, what he, she's like immediately dismisses his, his concern for her safety. Like, no, that's bullshit. Like, it's not possible. <laughs> uh, then uh, Lori refers to uh, the, owl, the owl den or cave. I don't know what he calls it. And he refers it to it as a magician's cave. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he says, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of puddles. I don't know how nice that looks. And we're, I'm going to split this next part up. So there, there's a conversation they have that we're going to get into in detail. Mm-hmm. Uh, but first I want to say this is like a tour of, of all of Dan Dryberg's Batman tendencies all right here. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, exactly. You know, his, te- his tech is excellent. 
you know, he's got air to air missiles on this, like this ship that is radar. That's like radar invisible and can mm-hmm. fly straight up and stuff. That's obviously a technological Marvel, even to this day. Right. Uh, he's got night vision goggles and he even tried to make an exoskeleton, but the exoskeleton broke his arm. Right. Cause it's, you know, it's, he it didn't do it. You know, it's hard to do, I guess that sort of pressure feedback stuff. And we, we come across now, now here's the conversation that happens while they're, while we're seeing all this stuff. Um, so Dan sort of tells Lori what his origin story is. Right. So we don't we don't really see, you know, the the classic origin stories. You sort of see the event, right? So you would see the the uh, the shooting of Bruce's parents, right. or you know Clark being shot right. to Earth in a spaceship, mm-hmm. or you know Peter Parker getting bit by the spider, right? Mm-hmm. But in this story, Dan's Dan's origin story is sort of recounted to us, right? Mm-hmm. So he tells us. Uh, and, and what drives him, right? This is what drives him for revenge. Are you ready for this? This is, this is one of my favorite things ever. So he's got all this technology, right? And it's all owl based, you know what I mean? Right. And it's all very specific and it's all very, you know, sort of niche and he does extra things to make stuff look like owls that he doesn't need to. Right. <laughs> and so you're thinking to yourself, man, this guy is obsessive. Something must be driving him toward this. Mm-hmm. And he literally says, <laughs> I was rich, bored. And there were enough other guys doing it, so I don't feel ridiculous. <laughs> That's literally why he got into superhero. So, one thing um, as I, as I'm um, you know going through these first few pages and everything, just noticing about Dan is that imagine if um, Batman, you know, doing what he did. Well, first of all, Dan is, is, is he's a second night owl, so the first night owl right. had none of this stuff. <laughs> no, you know, so he didn't take just any, like leather padding. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. it. You know, the only thing Dan pretty much took is was the name and mm-hmm. expound, and because he's a rich, you know, got rich and bored, and just expounded on everything, and you know, turned things into different owls, and you know, um, um, was doing everything to fashion, you know, um, owl weapons and owl, you know, technology and everything. Um, imagine if Batman took a break, right? Had nothing really to do, you know, was just bored and everything. And, um, you know, was just going around and 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 um, uh, just took a break for a few years. And then all of a sudden, you know, he 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 has a fellow superheroes, just say, for instance, Wonder Woman, um, just come back into his life and just re-energized him. You know, this is pretty mm-hmm. much, you know, where Dan is at at this point. You know, he was at a point where he was superheroing all the time or, you know, adventuring all the time. Then he just stopped. You know, he had to, you know, stop. You know, because of the um, Keen Act and everything, um, or retired. Um, I think there's more to all this. I, I really do, and, and the reason I do is that mm-hmm. I, I I truly believe that the reason he got into costumed adventuring is because he has a fetish about it. And is, is and again, when we talk about we talked about Rorschach's story, and we talked about how Rorschach's story does not sound like a hero's origin story. It mm-hmm. sounds like a villain's, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't sound like he's he's propelled toward any sort right. of you know greater good. I mean, he he feels that he is, of course, but mm-hmm. but it doesn't seem like he is. And and Dan here, you know, Dan here is 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 he, there's not there's no no drive that he's willing to admit to here, right? Right. He's like, oh, I wanted to be a part of a team. I wish the Crime Busters were to work out. It was like being in the Knights of the Round Table, right? Yeah, he's making all these he's, these excuses. He literally says, I mean, who needs all this hardware to catch hookers and purse snatchers, really? Right. right. Like he says thing. that. That's yeah. a, Exactly. <laughs> so, so, so for him, the point is all of that silliness, right? Mm-hmm. To him, the point is dressing up in a costume, and the point is making up all these ridiculous technological marvels that he can use for to stop petty crime, right? Right. That's the whole point for him. It's, it's, what, it's what drives him. It's what he enjoys. It's what you know, uh, excites him. Right. And, and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to gloss over this because it becomes important later in the chapter, but, but the twilight lady shows up here. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and he has her picture and Lori says, who's the twilight lady? And he says, Oh, that's just a vice queen from 68 that I took down. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that there's something to the fact that there probably aren't that many women in costumes and this is one. Right. And, and, you know, the question about desire for Dan is, you know, is he capable as a normal person of wanting a normal person? And, and to me, the answer is no. And right. I think that, that in addition to these, his stated reasons later on mm-hmm. for the famous Chapter 7 impotence that, 
mm-hmm. belong. You know, this comes out of Awkward, nowhere right. in comic books, mm-hmm. right? This comes right. out of nowhere and knocks you down. Right. You know, there's there's something fetishistic to this that I don't think you can dismiss. You can't. I think you need to. I think it's it's. Well, we're meant to know that this is a part of his. Like this is a bedrock thing for him. This this costume fetish. Well, I I think I think you're you're you know um 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 going on a, you know a great point and everything. So if you I guess want to relate it to Batman, you know Batman had to have a reason for doing it, and you, you know, in regular comics and you know um superhero stuff, you don't want to say it's like fetish stuff, but in reality, right. that's what it. <laughs> that's probably what it was. You know, he has had to be something that drives him. You want to say that it was murder of his parents and everything. You know this, right. but. A guy that has this thing in his mind, the single most thing that that motivates him to do this, you know, to to, to have his murder of his parents, you know, drive him to be this superhero all the time, you know, create all these toys, you know, um, and Batman has a lot of toys. Is that really necessary to fight crime, Batman? Um, No, it had to Mm. be a little bit some. Well, you you would think it'd be a little bit something more. And I think that's what Alan Moore is sort of like. You know, um, the point he's maybe driving into Dan Dryberg that this is an element of a person, you know, um, well, when, when I was basically saying that, you know, uh, Dryberg took a break and really had nothing, you know, got bored in his life. Um, and Laurie is sort of rekindling a lot of the spark, well, which we'll find out in a chapter of him mm-hmm. getting back into like mask adventuring. Um, she's really, um, um, everything was right there in front of his face, you know, what, as far right. as him being, you know, having a fetish and everything, you know, he was going through it back when he was with the comedian and, you know, going through like the crime busters and everything. Um, I'm sorry, the Minutemen. And then mm-hmm. finally he's about to get back to his purpose, you know, his fetish and everything, you know, going back to like the, um, the toys that he, <laughs> that, that, you know, he used to play with and everything because really right. he has nothing going on right now. No. He's he's like, and he keeps all this stuff too, right? Yeah. right? It's not like which he you would you would think. Mm-hmm. I mean, none of this stuff is. This is all incriminating, right? I mean, it's all like <laughs> you know, this is like having murder <laughs> evidence, evidence right, around, right, right? It's like having a bloody knife in your blood. You know what I mean? Sitting around and not not throwing it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's not mothballed any of it. It's just sitting around. He like threw a, a sheet over it. It's ready. He's ready to rip off the sheet and get ready back to business. You he, know, whenever he, he, he wants. He just needs a reason. Yes, he's looking for a reason. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And it's really no reason to use all these toys and everything, um, you know, until until um, these 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 events started happening. The murder of um, you know the comedian and the mystery of what's what's going on. And um, as Scott was saying we'll we'll get into a little bit more of that later in the chapter. But this is all this 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 um. This lighter, this light <laughs> that 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 Lori mistakenly um, lights up and everything yeah, right? is literally lighting a fire up under it's Dan. Hot, hot <laughs> down there. Hot. You know, I mean, Dan needs a reason, and Lori, you know, she just happens because of all the events that happened with Doctor Manhattan and her just searching. These are two mm-hmm. um, individuals that are searching for something, you know, searching for something in their lives that actually means something, mm-hmm. and they don't really know it yet. Yes. And there's all these metaphors for desire here. And Dan, like you said, Dan's listless. He's sort of, he kind of, it's like he wants to obsess over minutia and he loses himself in detail. Yes. You know what I mean? Like that's what he does. And and he has all these little intricate Mm -hmm. gadgets and things Mm -hmm. that he can click and touch and, and do crazy things. And then, you know, at the end of this, this conversation here, he shows Lori, he tells her to put on the night vision goggles. And, and when, he clicks off the light and she puts it on. He says, everything's clear as day. Mm-hmm. So when you look through his real eyes, his superhero eyes, right? Mm-hmm. You can see everything the, the way it's meant to be seen. Mm-hmm. And she likes it. She's into it. But then Dan just goes, oh, it's getting late. <laughs> like he cuts her off. Yeah, and then she it's, says it's, that it's he's demon. It's funny that she's into it like that. So um, mm-hmm. it's almost like she's finding a um, reason herself even if she maybe doesn't know it or is it some sort of denial in her of like the, mm-hmm. um, the adventuring because, you know, she was pushed into it by her mother, you know, right. so that's something that she keeps saying that she did not want to do and everything. And, but mm-hmm. you know, that, that this is just part of her life and everything. And, um, like I was saying in the beginning, she's just in amazement that, um, you know, that Dan has all this tech. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and she's been with Dr. Manhattan for the last 15 years or, mm-hmm. or longer than that. 
And and when you think about it, like she's marveling over all this, like this exoskeleton mm-hmm. and a spaceship and this these eye goggles. And she lived with a guy who literally invented like a new energy source for the entire world. Mm-hmm. And like, you know what I mean? It was doing like it can teleport people. It can change the matter by thinking about it and can duplicate himself. And mm-hmm. she's marveling at the things Dan has made. Mm-hmm. Like that's what's impressive to her because it's human. Right, 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 it's right, real. right, right. Something that she can actually um, uh, wrap her head around for the most part. Yes, yes. So the next piece is this conversation, and she and I want to stop before we jump into that. I want to say mm-hmm. she refers to Dan as Devo, and then she references Are We Not Men and Not either, and I'll say this Whip It or Satisfaction, which I would consider their two <laughs> bigger hits. Right. And I think not saying that says uh, like leaving that out right Mm -hmm. leaving out whip it and satisfaction is (laughs) has to be intentional right because when you hear devo that's what i think right yeah i think of the song whip it it's like the it's like the number one song it's like thinking of the beatles and not thinking about yesterday right Right. you you, you think about so so i think that's interesting that that there's a there's a again a hole something's missing there yeah and then then laurie tells uh dan the reason she left dr manhattan it's because i was so lonely uh, even when I was with him, he was never really there. Mm-hmm. There was no real human contact, no physical contact. I was so lonely. And so Dan sort of subconsciously goes to touch Lori's back, and then she notices, <laughs> and he goes, oh, I just need to adjust my hair. Just my hair out of place. You know what I mean? Try to be all smooth. Yeah, Dan is super lonely. <laughs> he is. He's lonely, too. And she says, uh, Lori says, it must be great having a secret identity. Dan hasn't Dan's, had none in so long. <laughs> uh, that's now. Here's a good question, right? This is I gotta ask you uh-huh, here. This is uh-huh. something that it comes up a little later in the dream sequence. Mm-hmm. But has it been like? Has it been since 1968? Like, is he unable to not incorporate this sort of thing into into sex? Is it like an obsession of his, or is it something that's more like a um? You know, is it is it just a general sense of you know, of, of listlessness and impotence that's preventing him from, from all dating. I, I, I think is this, the, the mass adventuring has a lot to do and a lot tie in with his sexual, you know, um, I, 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 I guess sexual, um, what do you want to call it here? Hangups? Um, yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, once that, the, the adventuring stopped, you know, he really has no desire. Well, I'm not going to say he has no desire. He probably has desire, but it's really just in caught in a, um, a, a, a fit of impudence, you know, impudence and everything, you know, Here's, uh, my take on it is this. Mm-hmm. I think he, he had sex with that, the twilight lady. And I think he did it because she was in a, a suit too. And I think that maybe it's possible that, that was before, before the that happened. Act, though, right? Yes. That was in the sixties. Okay. Yeah. He took her down in 68, so we can mm-hmm. assume during that process. It would be like, this is like a Batman tendency, like how sometimes he'll get with Catwoman yeah, or, yeah. or Talia al Ghul right. or whatever mm-hmm. when they feel like it's convenient for the writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I don't know that I think Batman's all that into them. That's my just personal <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh, There is a point so I, with that, too, you know. Um, yeah, but go ahead. That's, that's another podcast. <laughs> so I think, yeah, absolutely. So I think that it's possible that up until that point, he could have been he could have been functional as like a normal, average, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Sort of regular, red-blooded American man. But I think after that, he's not. I think that changed something for him, and it sort of, it sort of made other, other sort of lesser pleasures, I, I don't know, I don't want to say like unnecessary for him, but uh-huh. sort of not it just doesn't i mean it's like not scratching an itch that's itchy you know what i'm saying like right. he just it doesn't do anything for him. right 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 <laughs> so he needs a little bit of that now because he knows what it's like you know he has that experience and so he he's not going to be satisfied with less and who's in his house right now literally the only other mass <laughs> yeah, avenger that, that, that is can, a woman that, can, that, would that his... can relate even re- uh, relate to what he's mm-hmm. he's gone through and everything you know mm-hmm. and then um like i said after the king act how many uh, how many relationships you know j- uh, i guess you would you would you could look at um dryberg as like the ultimate nerd with all the, the yes. gadgets and the toys and everything that you know he did during his mass adventuring days um he had a reason to um you know just 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 geek out <laughs> you know do his thing and everything not all, all that is gone you know he's in his is 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 um apartment you know just doing regular normal stuff and you know it's like some geeks and nerds knowing stuff you know sometimes that's just 
you know, just what you do, you know, um, it, it's a trope, I guess, uh, nerds not are, aren't really, what do you want to say, um, they're not players. <laughs> they're, they're they're not liberated that way. Yeah, yeah, not 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 at all. You know, so they're inhibited, just like Lori says in a little bit. Inhibited, yeah, exactly, exactly. So he goes through all these years. I don't know how many relationships he's he's might have attempted or that he's been through or even having sex for that matter and everything. But Lori, you know, because she's been through what he's been through, and she's attractive, mm. <laughs> and she's in his house yes. at this time. Yep. She's seeking out something, you know, for her even being there um, <laughs> in the first place and everything. You know, this is almost like his chance at something, you know, some sort of, um, you know, to to reach out and just let go of mm. um, and uh, and and to get that fire back up under him. <laughs> Well, th- you know, well think about will. it this way, too. Like, I mean, this guy is essentially, I mean, he, he's he's certainly a metaphor for fandom. I mean, <clears throat> 100% yes, he is. And yes. we know that because he is a fan. He's a fan of Night Owl 1. Yes. We know that. He sends a letter and says, I'm a huge fan of you, Night Owl. <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> I'd like to become a Night Owl myself. Uh-huh. I have all this all these gadgets. Right. And, and when you think, of, like, for me, if I were to ever, let's say, when you know uh, magically fall into five trillion dollars and want to become batman this is the version <laughs> of batman i think i could be right i could buy all this stuff and then have it and right. then use it right right, right like right. i could do that i don't think right. i could do with the physical training and stuff i couldn't be <laughs> i couldn't be really be batman i mean that's my my batman tendency is i, I can't work out that much mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> but you know what i mean so that so there's something to that he's a fan and then he's like obsessed with it he, this right. is his obsession is all these little like how many owl suits does he have and he has these underwater suits and this like <laughs> arctic suit and this, this exoskeleton this, I mean, this is super batman tendency here the only thing that's missing is dryberg didn't have his parents murdered you know that's true um so other than that this is is, is it, these are toy these are literal toys to him yep and his dad says is that he says my dad i was surprised my dad left me all this money he wanted me to go into banking like him but instead i started getting into like you know mm-hmm. the stuff kids get into owls greek mythology you know <laughs> kids get into that stuff <laughs> That's like his deal. It's so weird. Yeah. Uh, but it's exactly like, but it's exactly, uh, it's, it's almost, it's not like backhanded thing, but it's like, you know, if you're, if you become obsessed with this, this world, right, you become obsessed with uh, costume vigilantism and, and you tie that into your sexuality, it's going to cause you to be off kilter in a lot of weird yeah, ways. Just a lot of complicated ways. And what is Lori really thinking? Because she's continuing to look at everything. You know, Mm -hmm. all this, you know, all this technology and amazement is she thinking in her mind, like, you know, what a geek, you know, what a, you know, is is she, she, is she just an awe of Dan? Like, you know, what is she, what is she just really thinking, you know, throughout this whole process? Because we're not really getting a gauge of what she is thinking, you know, about all this. We're just seeing her reactions for the most part. And she, you know, she comments here and there and everything. But Dan is pretty much going through um you know describing certain things and stuff you know <laughs> she's like air to air oh. missiles <laughs> <laughs> yeah right he's got air to air missiles and like Dime. like a flamethrower and like water <laughs> like it's, it's, this thing is insane it's so over prepped and i think that's what it is right mm-hmm. so think about like what dr manhattan does these incredible technical wonders and these incredible magical things right but he doesn't really try he's not putting forth any effort mm-hmm. to do those things he's not really investing a lot of time uh he's not really you know he it just he just makes it happen uh-huh. effortlessly with the wave of his hand and a thought. But Dan can't do that. Right. No, not For at all. Dan to make these things, it takes intensive concentration and effort mm-hmm. over years and years and years. And that's a human connection for her. That's that yeah. is effort. That's yeah. that focus. Yeah. It's the opposite of what Dr. Manhattan right. was doing at the right. beginning of chapter three. Well, Dr. Manhattan, if you want to think about it, you know, if a geek was to really f- use their full powers, if there was ever such thing, that would be Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> No, but no. as soon as you get the powers, I mean, he's not interested in this comic book world. Not at all. You know what I mean? He's, not at all. He, it's all contrived to him, and so yeah. he leaves. That's yeah. Doctor Manhattan. I mean, that's just to- we're, we're talking about lack of empathy. <laughs> Doctor Manhattan mm-hmm. just in, in you know exhibits that you know to the fullest and everything. And like Scott said, you know this connection, um, whatever judgments or whatever um lori may be making in her head about you know dryberg and you know all this crazy technology what do you need it for her whole th- appreciation is the co- human connection that she's making with um with this period you know she's right. happy because of what, what what she's been through with dr manhattan is just just far and beyond just nothing anybody's ever been through you know all the um 
Um, and, and, and I guess it just goes to show you the appreciation of having that human connection with someone. Mm -hmm. Just forget all the judgments of, you know, what a person is, what a person did, uh, what a person, you know, how a person conducts himself and everything. You know, if, Dre if Dryberg may feel a certain way about, you know, him having all these geeked out toys and everything, mm -hmm. um, um, feeling, OK, well, you know, he knows it's overboard. You know, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like a grown man playing with toys and everything. You know, um, maybe he doesn't want, you know, Lori to feel a certain way about that. But Lori's not even thinking about that. You know, she's just right. happy to have this connection, a human connection mm -hmm. that she could touch and feel. Exactly. And so Dan, think about Dan as a comic book fan and Lori is not not, you know, character here. Mm -hmm. he, she comes into his inner sanctum and sees all of his toys, all of his his night owl collection. Right. Like it's a collection of night owl memorabilia that he has in his basement and, and glass display cases. Mm -hmm. And she's interested in it. She's interested in it. And that's what I think really piques his interest, too. It's almost like for me, when someone starts talking about Mega Man 2 and I'm just out in the world, mm -hmm. I'm like, hold on, I'm going to stop and talk about about this. And we're going to talk about my favorite music, which is Flash Band's music, which is lucky because it's the first stage in the speed run. Don't add. You can hate Scott. <laughs> <and I'll be laughs> Or, or even, Flash Man's music is the best music in that game. Or even think about it too. Okay, Dan is the geek. Dan is the nerd. Dan is yes. the you know the yes. um uh, uh she he's into everything that no one else is into. You know the classic mm -hmm. or I guess Revenge of the Nerds type you know old school crap. Um, Lori is the hot find you know um girl the 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 girl in the high school and everything you know all, all the girls you know aspire to and everything she goes out with the um the the jock you know football guy or whatever but you know the football guy relation their relationship is is the fo he's he's too into what he's into and it's not really giving right. her enough attention and everything so she meets classic trope she she ends up meeting dan you know, Dan is yep. much more willing to, um, you know, give her a little bit more attention. You know, that 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 he, that connection and everything that she's been missing. Uh, it doesn't matter that, that he's a geek and all the other, you know, um, high schoolers and everything think that he's a geek and a loser or whatever. Um, she's appreciating the fact that um, that she's that he's actually going to give her that attention that she's mm -hmm. been missing, um, that he's able to give her. You know, from um, that that her her jock boyfriend wasn't able to. So that's yeah. That, I, I guess that's what I'm interpreting um, a little bit from their story because these. I mean, if you if you if you're talking about two people that are not supposed to be together, I mean, him and Lori. Mm. Absolutely, I I agree. But it's it and it must be weird that that she's she's responding so positively to all this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know that it, it's 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 like she's falling into his lap, and she's acting so positively. Mm -hmm. And she's, you know, she's flirting with him. She says, how do you, she says, how do you want your coffee? And she says, sure, black as the devil and sweet as a stolen kiss. And Dan just like, huh? Classic <laughs> like, geek, classic geek, classic nerd. Okay, stuff just goes over your head, Dan. You know, it's right there in your face. This girl is right in, you know, she's giving you the signals and everything, you know, mm -hmm. but if, if he's not. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> And then, and then, so so she says that after all that mm -hmm. sort of, you know, I, I feel like there was a lot of innuendo there and a lot of like you know, tension. Oh yeah. And that uh, Dan probably should have picked up on. I agree with you there. Mm -hmm. uh, but Dan, Lori doesn't think there's a mass killer, and so they decide to watch the six o'clock news. And so Dan puts more sugar away, gets some sugar out. She says she likes lots of sugar. Mm -hmm. She likes it sweet. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Lori goes into the living room and turns on the TV. And then Dan walks in, and this is uh, so funny. This is like this is a hilarious thing. He's talking about, you know, how he hasn't written anything and he writes in ornithological journals and he says, uh, usually as soon as I mention ornithology, folks sort of switch off and, and then and Lori goes, shh. <laughs> 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 as soon as, you know, as soon as I talk about ornithology. Yeah, that's, that's, that's that Alan Moore comedy boy. <laughs> that makes me laugh. And so we're treated to the six o'clock news. Some of the stuff on the six o'clock news is uh, is interesting. So we're treated to the interior of Rorschach's apartment, which you know, there's a Simpsons bit where like the wall of Lenny's house falls down, and he's sitting there eating like a can of beans at a t at a spare table, and he says, "Please don't tell, <laughs> please don't tell anyone how I live." That's how Rorschach lives. Uh, and uh, the landlady says that Rorschach was a Nazi pervert, which is probably half right. And that he propositioned her sexually, Liar. Uh, which Laura yells, I knew it. That is not correct. He <laughs> found her to be disgusting, which we know from his journal. <laughs> and there's a bunch of wingnut newspapers, which I guess is uh, not something we wouldn't know anything about wingnut publishing in this uh, in mm -hmm. our era right now. So mm -hmm. nothing to compare that to, thank goodness. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, they sort of react to these things. Uh, you know, Dan gives his uh, thoughts on Rorschach. He says, uh, you know, I never dreamed he'd ever shoot anybody with that grappling gun I made him that he used to almost murder a cop. You know, that's not great. Being the uh, the arm smith for the uh, <laughs> for the notorious cop, you know, cop killer is not probably mm-hmm. not a good not a good space to be legally. Right. Uh, and then the big news, which is Russia invades Afghanistan. Uh, that's that's big because uh, that is a direct response to Doctor Manhattan not being around, and it almost seems like a test to see if he really is. Right. And so they invade Afghanistan to see if Nixon really is just hiding Doctor Manhattan and will spring them on him here. Right. Uh, obviously, Nixon isn't. Right. So call. So they call. So he can't really call their bluff. And then we see more un- unrest everywhere. Uh, we see, you know, President Nixon says that they'll evaluate all of their options. There are peace protests in England where cops beat women with, with bats. Right. And that's sort of one panel, and then we just sort of move on from that. Just a little a little background with the terror that's gripping the world. Look also how, um, um, pay attention to Dryberg's. Dryberg throughout this, you know, um, as Lori is coming up the stairs, you know, into the kitchen and, you know, um, watching them both watching the TV. Dan is preparing coffee. But mm-hmm. I think in his mind, he just cannot believe he has a female up in his house. <laughs> I know, right? You know, I actually have a live, you know, a uh, female up in, the, uh, up in his house. And I don't think he really knows how to react to her. You know, um, Lori is comfortable. Mm-hmm. Lori's comfortable, but he's more excited that he has Silk Spectre in his house, mm-hmm. I think. <laughs> That's my that's my take on oh, it. Yeah, yeah, he likes yeah. he likes Lori and he thinks Lori's pretty, but he likes he really likes Silk Spectre. Yeah. He likes Silk Spectre too. Yeah. That's who he really likes. So 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 and, he, um, he's he's looking at her, you know, he's um um answering some of her questions and everything. She's just going on and on about, you know, on the news and you know, stuff on the news in the world. But Dan is 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 uh Dan is, <laughs> Dan is um um um, like I said, just happy that he has a female up in his house, you know. Um, I mean, I don't know how much how, how much more I can say about that, but um, yeah, he's he's. I'm just looking at these panels and everything and his reactions and um, when Lori he doesn't really know what to do. Yeah, he doesn't really know what to do. That awkwardness and everything. Um, Lori um, takes has him to take off his glasses and everything and says yeah. how how handsome he is, ravishing he is, and everything. And, oh, that, that, that just probably just over the moon for Dan. <laughs> He's basically like, she's like, oh, you look so good without your glasses on. He's like, uh, b- birds? <laughs> 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 I mean, it's not that sad, but. Uh, and then, it uh, probably the, is. <laughs> yeah, uh, birds. Uh, I write ornithological journals, and people tell me to shut up when I bring them oh, up, so I'm bringing man. them up. Yeah, yeah. But then there's... she tells him to shut up. I like, I, I can't get. I'm sorry. I know we talked about that. I just can't get over how funny that is. That he's like, people always tell me to sh- to shove it when I bring up birds. <laughs> She's like, shut up about your birds. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th- these are two people in uh, in in other any other story or any other um um function of life. They would not be coming together, but the no. single most connection to them is the fact that they were costume adventuring together. Yes, that's that's the thing they have in common is their co- costume adventuring, and then uh, so on the TV while this is going on, it's mm-hmm. sort of like a like a you know an aggressive seduction by Lori. She, she's the initiator here, so she's the one that, that's taking the initiative. You know, she wants a connection because she's really Lori, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I, and I think that ultimately Dryberg isn't Dryberg. He's really Night Owl too, right? That's what his problem is. So so she's she's saying this is my real face, and he's saying it's not mine. But we are treated to this this montage this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the symbolic montage of Ozymandias uh, showing up to do a charity performance, mm-hmm. and apparently it's uh, it's gymnastics for some reason, and uh, and uh, just to kind of hold on a second, he uh, this is running. Um, there's nothing really going on other than you know nothing's happening at all in the background. There's definitely not any sort of uh, perfume ad or anything. But then V comes on, and there's a montage of him doing gymnastics easily, flawlessly, even at the age of 42. They mention mm-hmm. how old he is and how striking it is that he can move with such grace. And then they say, "Moving into the handstand now, not even the slightest tremor of effort," <laughs> which is obviously <laughs> obviously means something. And we're we're treated, and I use that term, uh, you know, I uh, use that term. Uh, uh, jokingly here mm-hmm. to uh, to Dan not being able to perform the handstand now without a tremor of effort. Not so uh, much grace either, you know. Not any grace <laughs> either. No, uh, it doesn't. Nothing really happens. We are there's a little bit of nudity on this page in case that's something you care about, uh, which is interesting. So 
then uh, they can't really consummate the uh, the relationship. They can't act on this attraction. So Dan sort of lies down, and Lori kind of covers him up and says, "It's okay. Yeah, it's it's just, okay. It's, it's just okay. okay." And everything. She Lori, and Lori is super great about this because you know she been she's been through worse. She's she's <laughs> she she had Doctor Manhattan just just not pay any attention to her. You know, um, give her any type of uh, mental. You know. Um, uh, what I want to say here, just um, just just not any type of empathy and everything, you know, um, with her, mm-hmm. um, and Dan Drybert has done more than enough, you know, um, so far, you know, um, as far as um, like their their, you know, everything that she had that that she's done up to until now, you know, Dan Drybert is more or less, you know, he's been really good to her, um, versus what what's been going on with Doctor Manhattan. One mm-hmm. thing I did want to point out, um, there's a key thing, <laughs> a key, a key plot point that happens on page 13 in the first, in the second panel. Um, mm-hmm. um, Dr- Max Shea is missing. He's a missing writer. Yes. He wrote the, uh, he's the one that wrote the, uh, the Black Freighter, right? Uh, yeah. Is that him? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he's the one that wrote the Black Freighter we've been reading along with. Uh, he's also a famous novelist and no one knows where he is. Yeah. Just gone. Yep. Shh, go Pretty on. much, you know, the, the, the news just, um, you know, uh, and, and it's amazing because we'll get into that and how that affects, um, you know, a lot of things in, la- in the later chapters. But um, they just dropped this little dime here. <laughs> yes. You know, it's definitely as, something a, as a remember. news bit, you know. So right. It makes it really good. It's 100 percent something to keep track of for sure. Is this this author not being around and where he is, and and mm-hmm. definitely his relationship to the main plot of the story and and what his story tells us um, about you know uh, about the you know the overarching story. Right. Um. So now now Dan is asleep, and so we are treated to a dream sequence, and this is a fairly famous one. So I'll, I'm going to kind of uh, I'm going to explain what happens and kind of then explain what it means. Mm-hmm. All right. So Dan. It sees the Twilight Lady. He runs to her with his arms outstretched. They embrace. They sort of peel each other's clothes off, sort of like they're wearing, you know, tear-offs, right? Mm-hmm. And now they're nude. So when and then Twilight Lady peels off Dan's skin to reveal underneath his skin that he is wearing his owl suit. Mm-hmm. Okay? And then Dan, in the owl suit, pulls apart the naked Twilight Lady to reveal a costumed Lori. And then they are just about to kiss when nu- a nuclear blast vaporizes them, leaving them in the lover's embrace from all those those paintings, every, all that graffiti, and just their skeletons. Right. Okay. Then Dan wakes up. So I'm going to break this down. This is what I think this all means. All right. So Dan, this is why I think that he, he had sex with the Twilight Lady. <laughs> okay. Because he was Dan. Mm-hmm. And then he encountered her, mm-hmm. and then they had they had sex, so they were naked. Mm-hmm. And then he found, then she revealed to him that he's really Night Owl underneath of this bedrock. He's Night Owl. He's not Dan. Ah, okay, okay. So he's had all this desire that's been toward this this Twilight Lady. Who knows where she's been? Maybe in prison. Who knows what's going on with that? Mm-hmm. So he peels her apart, and underneath her is Lori. Mm-hmm. But it's not just Lori; it's Silk Spectre. Mm. Okay, and then as soon as Dan gets Silk Spectre in his arms. A nuclear holocaust wipes them out. Okay, right. So this is this is overall a, a symbol for his concern. So he feels that he's finally got the only woman that could really satisfy him, which is a costumed adventurer. Right. Right. That's what he needs. It's what he's, it's what his bedrock needs. It's someone who sees him as Night Owl also doesn't see him as Dan. Right. And he's worried, and he thinks he feels like just his luck. As soon as he meets this woman, this perfect woman, as soon as he gets with this perfect woman, mm-hmm. they're going to be vaporized and annihilated by a nuclear holocaust. So in his mind, he's sort of like as his ideal, you know, version of a uh, of a woman of what he wants. Um, you yes, know, with the Twilight Lady and everything, mm-hmm. and you know, no other lady is really satisfy him if he's even seeked and you know seek, seek any other um, females out. You know, past mm-hmm. that point, um, until Lori comes along, um, until Silk Spectre, you know, comes along, right? Um, and you know, he finally is in a position where you know he isn't, you know, he, he's in dreaming mode and everything with her, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden everything just blows up. You know, it's still that um that that fear and everything of you know the heightened tensions and everything of the world, and all of a sudden everything just blows up, and he just wakes up in a sweat. Yep, because he's terrified. Mm-hmm. 
and he sort of kisses Lori's hand and says, you know, this, he, he acknowledges this is what he wants. Mm-hmm. And then he walks out. As she, as she walks out of the, uh, the living room, she says, oh, John, do you have no, 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 she's saying their ex-boyfriend's name in her sleep, which is probably not great for his ego. <laughs> so now Dan walks to the kitchen mm-hmm. and we see that the window, right? Mm-hmm. He sees the window. He sees the outside. It's, uh, you know, it's nighttime. He wipes dust away from the window. Mm-hmm. Uh, time has obscured his vision of the world. So right. another viewport that's being, you know, illuminated by, you know, removing that sort of accretion and getting back to the way things were. Mm-hmm. So another, it harkens to a return. And so Dan goes downstairs. And then Lori sort of wakes up and comes downstairs and says, Dan, where are you? And Dan's downstairs wearing the goggles. And he says, uh, this war, this feeling, it's all unavoidable. It makes me feel so powerless. Keep in mind, too, Dan is doing all this naked. He doesn't have any yes. clothes on. Totally know? naked. Yep, totally naked. Just him and the goggles. Right, right. And, 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 yeah. and you know, Lori, um, they, they, they tried and everything to have sex, and, you know, um, Dan couldn't get it up. You know, but still, Lori is so great about how she is with Dan at this point. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so he says, then he says, so impotent. And it's this panel where the impotence sort of arcs down toward his crotch and it's over his like sort of, you know, mm-hmm. he's kind of like got a barrel chest now. He's not like super ripped like you would think of, a, you know, the archetypal superhero body, you know. Mm-hmm. He's a little paunchy because he's about 40 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so they kind of talk for a little bit. It's like, oh, man, I wish we could get out there and get crazy. And then. Lori's like, why don't, why don't, what's stopping us? Why don't we just go do it? And she says she's going to go get dressed. All right. And then she says, then Dan gets dressed. Dan puts his goggles on, looks at his owl suit, sort of is like, you know, this is it. This is what I want. Gets, uh, puts everything on. All then he needed Lori was comes, a reason. That's it. He just needed a little bit of a, a push. And then Lori comes downstairs wearing a trench coat and says, Dan, I'm ready. <clears throat> and then the bottom panel of that, page 21 there, is the tiniest word bubble maybe in the whole, like in comparison to the size of the panel in the whole story. Mm -hmm. And he says, me too, let's go. Tiny, tiny word bubbles, huge picture of him. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Huge image of Night Owl and Archimedes in the background with his clenched fist, like, yeah, here it is. Oh, man, I'm ready. (laughs) He's ready. I'm ready. He's always been ready and everything, but, you know, Mm -hmm. it's it's one thing of what your your body wants versus what your mind does. You know, your mind is telling you, okay, well, um, you don't need to be doing this. It's ridiculous. You know, you got toys and stuff, blah, blah, blah. Just lead a regular life. You can possibly go be a banker or what have you. But right. your, 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 your body, your, your soul and everything is saying this is who you are. This is, you know, what you need and everything. But he just mm-hmm. needed Lori. You know, he just needed someone to come in and just really give him that, that, that nudge, that reason. You know, he was already there. Lori just pretty much says, well, let's just go and do it. Right? I mean, we're already dressed up. You have all the stuff. You have all the stuff. It's like yes. you need to go get your stuff. All my stuff got shipped here. All my stuff's here. Right, right, right. Let's get after it. <laughs> Let's this just is go what and we do, do. It. Let's just, Yeah, it's what yeah. we do. <laughs> and for Lori, it seems almost like this is a little different. It's a different way for her. It's like she's coming along with him. And, and, right. and it's different because her motivation for doing crime fighting was essentially enrichment. Right. You know what I mean? It was to make money. And that, that's, you know, the reason her mother pushed her into it. So mm-hmm. this, is, this is like a different method, a different way for her to come come out as a superhero but also it's another point too because Lori is it's been so long as since Lori has touched you know her her costume and done the, the superheroing and everything maybe she's coming at this from a different perspective of being you know grown and just just realizing you know how, how as an adult you just come into your own at some point you don't really know mm-hmm. who you are until it actually you know sometimes it takes you know a person a whole life to finally realize who they are you know Lori mm-hmm. has come to a point where she's comfortable getting back into that costume because at this point she I don't think she ever thought that she was going to get back into, you know, um, you know, Matt uh, adventure and everything. And, and then right. she happens upon Dan sees Dan has all this this crazy stuff, toys and stuff and is nudging right. Dan said, well, why not? You know, Dan is. I don't know. It probably took him like two seconds to put that costume back on and say, ready, I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I've been ready. I've been ready. ready, you know. And then, um, um, you know, they, they, they go out. They, they finally go out, you know, into the, um, into uh-huh. the tunnel and everything, you know, uh-huh. to see what the night is like. 
Yeah, and the other thing for Lori is that she's been Dr. Manhattan's sidekick for the last 20 years, basically. And mm-hmm. so now she's like, you know, again, this is a little more dangerous. It's not like going out with Dr. Manhattan where you knew nothing could happen to you. Right, right. Because Dr. Manhattan could undo it. Right. Dan can't do that, and she knows it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's sort of like analog, you know. It's it's interesting for her. Mm-hmm. So so they come out, uh, uh, you know, a couple blocks down the tunnel in a warehouse Dan also owns. Right, that's the other thing they find. Mm-hmm. And um, they find a tenement fire. And people have been, you know, these landlords <laughs> have been setting these fires to get low rent tenants out. So this is like arson, right. and, and they can they know it's arson because it's been happening. Right. And so uh, Dan flies in, and they talk about what they can do to stop it. And Dan says, "We noticed your situation." My oh, goodness gracious, he says that. Uh, and then he says, you know, hey, come on. Uh, it's it's being attended to. And so the, he has water cannons and cameras on this thing, by the way. Like, what else? What doesn't he have in this this owl? <laughs> and uh, they sort of knock the fire down a little bit. And he says, you know, we got to get people out of there. I'll extend a ramp. And then Lori says, I'm not going to need this trench coat if I'm going to be next to the fire. <laughs> and then she takes off the trench coat and then says, well. And then Dan turned around and goes like, oh, well, what? She's like, take a look at this kind of, you know. And then she says, what do you, and he's sort of like well, staring at her, right? Mm-hmm. And then she says, uh, you know, what about the ramp? We need to get moving. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah, hold on a second. And he puts the ramp down. So, Lori. <laughs> he's distracted. It's understandable. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the, 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 I think Lori knows what she's doing. But mm-hmm. at oh, the same sure. time, she, you know, she, she plays it off. Oh, man, Dan is... You don't wear that trench coat and then take that trench coat off unless you plan to have an effect. Mm. Like, that's that's an effect. That's effect planning, yes. not necessarily weather, yes, weather yes, maintenance. Yes, 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 yes. Dan needs something to um, light his fire. <laughs> let yeah, me right, put on my silk belt outfit, you know, let's see let's, let's see how, you know, let's, let's see if he still keeps it down, guys. <laughs> and, and he's literally through the roof immediately, right? <laughs> literally through the roof. I, I can't, I can't... I can't say enough how hilarious it is mm-hmm. that they he literally goes immediately. The next time we see him, he's through the roof. <laughs> Think much. about how funny that is. All right, sorry. <laughs> uh, and then he takes. So he says, "I'm going to take my steering column up here. I'll t- <laughs> drive this thing from up top." That is. Funny. Uh, and then he get, no. he attaches it and he says, "Oh, I'll get you guys some coffee, chill out for a while." And he starts playing Billy Holiday, the song "You're My Thrill," <laughs> which you know he probably picked from a Spotify playlist in 1985. <laughs> In 1985. <laughs> right. He has that. That's on an 8-track somewhere in there, right? Because the thing's from the 70s. Mm, oh, yeah, so right? Def- yeah, right? So he's definitely an 8-track player in that in that owl. Because uh-huh. it's not been out for six years. They didn't have cassettes in 70 so. Not at all. <laughs> all right. So they, so they get all the people out of there. You know, there's this montage. She makes, like, Lori makes everyone coffee. Well, hold on. Back, 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 someone- back up. The second panel um um of the 26 he's just smiling he's like you know oh, don't yeah. worry about me i'm fine i'm just fine that look on his face dan is in his element now i mean <laughs> this is like this is probably the wrong thing you could have done to this guy and everything but you know he's he's over the when scott say you know he's through the roof he's literally through, through the roof he's he's on top the of the roof. world you know he's in his element you know he's back at the point where you know uh he could die doing this you know, Dan right, is he very care. fulfilled now. Yeah, that smile on his face, you're right, it's enormous. And it's so markedly different from his expression on every other panel that he's yes, in so yes, far. Yes, yes, story. yes, yes, great point. Because we don't really, we don't see Dan smile at all until this. No. He's such a sad sack. Yeah. And you can understand why now. Because right. he doesn't, he, he wants this connection with another Max Adventure. And he thought he was building that with Rorschach. But obviously, you know, they both don't, they don't work that way. You know what I mean? Well, well, not even so much, not only the connection, the sense of purpose. You know, yes. Dan now has he, his sense of purpose is back. He it really um, and, and, and these two characters have grown since the last time they touched their costumes and everything. So they mm-hmm. was doing it for a reason before, you know, just Dan was just doing it, you know, maybe because he fetishized and, um, you know, he was just adventuring and all that stuff, you know, because he was bored or what have you. Lori, she got pushed into it because of her mom and everything. Now they're at a point where they're doing it because they want to. Right. That's a that's a very important element because you're doing it because you want to and because this is probably what you should have been doing the whole time and everything. So when yes. I when I talk about a person finding themselves maybe denying a sense of themselves when they were younger, they come back to it's like leaving something and then come back to a point where okay, well this is it. This is this is who I am and everything. Mm. You 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 were brought up a certain way and then all of a sudden, you know, you you 
you've denied a certain part of yourself so long then you eventually as an adult you come back to it and realize well this is who i am this is who i've i should have been like the whole time um yep. it doesn't always happen like that or as perfect as like that but um dan and Lori are at the point especially dan of of having um of of having his sense of purpose right on on top of the um the ship right now yes and he's got Lori in the ship helping the people out telling him not to use the flamethrower to light a cigarette that's important information that i'm glad she has hilarious hilarious little panel right there <laughs> like if you want to burn down the whole neighborhood because someone's hit the, the fire button uh, everything used to have oh, a little context for the younger people. Everything used to have a cigarette lighter in it. Literally everything in the whole world had a cigarette lighter in it. Cars, yeah, yeah, you know, airplanes, yeah, airplanes, uh, yeah. malls, mm -hmm. uh, the bank, everywhere. There were just cigarette lighters and ashtrays everywhere back in the 80s, <laughs> like 30 years ago. Yeah. It, was a, it was a smoker's convertible paradise. For yes, it was. Yes, it was. <laughs> so that's not a, it would not be on you so i want to say that because it would not be unusual for you to be like i wonder where the ashtray is or i wonder where the cigarette lighter is in this room mm -hmm. right because it just would be it's ubiquitous uh so they let the people out and then uh Lori says uh you know what should we do next or you want to do this tomorrow night and then uh he says it was billy holiday singing that song and uh they kiss and there is a very tasteful montage that indicates that uh, there is something more than kissing happening here. Oh yeah, yeah, very, very well put together by um, by um, Dave Gibbons, you know, on, yes. on, in illustrating that and everything. And just, um, just kidding. It's not that. It's not that subtle. Uh, <laughs> they, hit the, they hit the flamethrower button. <laughs> the flame just goes arcs out into the night, uh, lashes uh, right in the sky, right above Manhattan. Right, mm -hmm. obviously. Right, in Manhattan has to know about it. They have to see it. It's right in front of Manhattan's face. Yeah, right. So right. Manhattan right. has you, to you, know you, they you had would, sex. You, you, yeah, you would think that you know it. Um, is is you know if people look up in the sky, they, they see they see all this the uh, all this you know lit up and going on and everything. One thing I do want to compliment when I keep talking about how great Lori is and everything uh, with, with Dan, um, how patient she is you know, with um, his impudence and everything and her just trying it again. You know yeah. what I'm saying? You know, at first, you know, they, they couldn't do it because, you know, uh, uh, some females, they were just like, okay, well, you know, huh, you know, I'll just leave it at that and just go on about my merry way or whatever. Lori, mm -hmm. I think she's really in tune to Dan and his, 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 um, his sense of self-worth at that point and tries it again with them. You know, because I think she, by by judging by the panels, she's the one that's trying to initiate this again. You know, as far as them, um, you know, having sex and everything, and right. um, they go through like the tasteful, quote unquote, tasteful montage, right. um, and uh, they they just get it on. You know, they do, and and I will say this: we've talked about a couple scenes from the movie that we've really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. This is a scene from the movie I did not enjoy. So this is we'll a this is that. a goal, an old skip forward. We'll, 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 we'll get to the movie. Oh, it's a lot of oh. stuff I would need to con oh. need to talk about regarding the movie that did not do this book justice. So, this particular scene, right, right, right. It sticks out. So uh, just just to get, uh, cards on the table. The, mm -hmm. the comic book did this one better. So maybe just read this part. There we go. Uh, and. Uh, so I, and I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, for well, he's Dan's driving this thing. I thought he looked like a chariot, like I riding a chariot, like from Ben Hur. You know what I mean? Like right. he's got these horses in front of him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to point out that it's it's they're obviously where they're having sex is important because I and I think that's true because like Lori's Lori's ex boyfriend is named Doctor Manhattan, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they're have they're doing this in the full view of Manhattan, Manhattan right? Right. <laughs> right over the right over Manhattan's head, mm -hmm. like right in there. So that's, <laughs> Almost like That's right something. in his face, you know. I know he can't miss it. It'd be really hard for Manhattan not to notice this <laughs> no, happened. Right, it's a exactly. flamethrower, you know. You know, it's a huge yeah. light up. And then uh, we um we we, we see yes. Lori. We we think Lori quit smoking, but no, she's back at it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a double innuendo too, because she's smoking one of these crack pipe cigarettes. <clears throat> she, and Dan says, "I thought you quit." He means cigarettes, and he also means mm -hmm. uh, adventuring, yeah. dressing up in the right. uh, in the uh, in the suit. And they say, "I guess the costumes had something to do with it." It just feels strange, you know, to come out and admit it, come out of the closet, mm -hmm. which in 1985 was much more like, you know. The, the closet thing was not as ubiquitous of a, of a thing back then. 
Well, well, she like, asked a, a, a deep question. Okay, she says, Dan, um, what's tonight good? Did you like it? You know, sort of like just reassuring Dan that it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's okay. I mean, you know, did this, did this, did this turn you back on? Did this, um, um, did this, did this wake you up? Right. Dan needed to be woken up, and Lori knew that. I mm -hmm. think, you know, for the most part, if she didn't explicitly say that, you know, she knew that. So her for her to ask this question on the last page, you know, Dan, was it was tonight good? Did you like it? You know, mm -hmm. it was her pretty much saying, OK, you know, uh, have I woken you up yet? <laughs> and she's been trying. So I feel like she's that's an important trying, yeah. line, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. She's been trying this whole time to, to sort of press that button for him. Right. To press right. that night owl button. Right. The whole time. That's that's what all this has been about for her almost has been, you know, this is something I know he wants. This is something mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it for him. And I'm talking about all these nerdy things. And, and it, it's I mean, that's an interesting that's an interesting in itself, quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, that she's, you know, this this panel. I mean, it seems like she's genuinely interested in Dan and generally wants him to be happy. But is her interest in these these night owl things? Is, is that genuine? And almost it brings that into question a little bit here, right? Well, she says, did I make it good? It almost feels like, was that a natural thing for her? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, like I said, in, in a different world, like, you know, would these two even be like on each other's radar? You know, I would right. think really not, but you know, and this, uh, because they have this connection and everything. And when you talk, when you, when you were talking about, about buttons being pushed, she literally in the beginning of um, the first couple pages, pushed that fire button to light mm -hmm. up the, um, the um you know his 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 um underground layer and everything and she's been trying to push literally push his button you know the whole time to wake him up to light him up mm -hmm. you know if you want to call it that light, light that fire and everything you know and essentially this awkward chapter <laughs> as has right. been such a if you want to call it a trope it, I, I guess it is was it really a trope back in, um, you know, back in 1985? I don't know, but um, no it's, way, it's no a, it's, chance. It's, it's it's a trope now, you know, for the nerd to 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 score the hot girl, you know, right? <laughs> you right. know, um, and they're at that point right now. Absolutely, absolutely. And then and then she's sort of like, there's all this in you, and she's like, uh, she's saying like, "Ooh, you're real passionate. You have a huge appetite now, mm -hmm. huh?" And he says, "You're right. I have a big appetite." And then Lori says. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm open to suggestions. What should we do next? Meaning sex. I think she means sex. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then Dan just goes, I think we should spring Rorschach, meaning his his appetite is is also open for the adventuring. It's not just the wait, costume wait, wait, for him. Wait, wait, it's wait, also wait, the adventuring. Wait, wait, wait. Hold up. So he said we should bring out, spring out Rorschach. If that's not a mic drop. Right. I don't know what is. You know, he's re after all this and everything. Dan is not so much, okay, he's not ready to go out and save more folks. He's ready to go for the gusto to go to prison and spring Rorschach. You know, man, that is, I, I mean, to me, that's, and, and Lori reacts too because it's one panel where there's no words, and then the last panel, uh, uh, Lori's like, what? <laughs> well, she's shocked. Imagine, imagine being in a scenario similar to this, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and if I were to be like, I know, I, like, you're right, I have a huge appetite mm -hmm. for podcasting. I need to call, we, Sam and I need to record an episode. Like, that would not be, I, I do not believe that would be accepted with, with you know, uh -huh. anything but iciness and hate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like, that's, you know, she has this guy, he's super focused on her, focused on her, focused on her, and then the next thing he says is, let's go spring my old partner, right? Let's get him out of jail because we have to. And I think it, it also belies that, yeah, it's a, it's not just for him. It's not just the costumes. The costumes are important for him. Uh -huh. But the adventuring is important for Dan as well. Well, I mean. Like he it, gets it, a little it, thrill out of it. Oh, he gets super. I mean, because you're, you're going straight from not doing anything, you know, just, you know, mm -hmm. um, putting in sugar cubes and going to visit Hollis and everything. All of a sudden, you're springing Rorschach out of prison now. Right. <laughs> right. You're flying around. And, 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 you're, and you're Lori, betting. And then Lori is as is, is much is to blame as anybody. You know, she didn't. She didn't um, let this monster out. You know. <laughs> well, think about this turnaround for this dude. I mean, imagine. Remember what his life was like before he became Night Out. It was all about uh -huh. Greek mythology and birds. And then after he was Night Out, guess what it was about again? Mm -hmm. Greek mythology and birds. birds. <laughs> and now he's in a spaceship, sitting floating above Manhattan, mm -hmm. and he just he just bed Doctor Manhattan's live-in girlfriend. Yes. That's risky. Yes, <laughs> that yes, is the definition yes, of risky yes, behavior. Yes. I mean, he's just, hey, you know, this it, say, it says a lot about him. You know, he's not mm -hmm. he's not that um that that introvert. 
you know, as as um as he made display. You know, he has a he has a certain thing up in him. Like and like you said, he has this element of just adventuring. It's just in his soul. You know, he's yes. ready to he's ready to do it. He's a little bit of an adrenaline junkie in addition to being oh, a, a little bit. And that's cool. That's OK. <laughs> yeah, that's he's okay. allowed. Right, 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 right. People right. like the things they like. Right, 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 right. right. Well, let's not be judgmental <laughs> about these. Let's not be, be clear. I'm not being judgmental. It's cool that he's into all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But he is. All right. And then, uh, the, the very last panel, the, the words of the um, uh, is I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. Uh, my skin is black upon me and my bones are burned with heat. This is from Job chapter 30, verse 29 to 30. <laughs> and, for the, and for those who don't know about the book of Job, the book of Job is a biblical book where effectively the, the premise is uh, God and the devil sort of make a bet. And it's uh, the devil says, I bet I can make this guy curse you. And God's like, no, you can't. Mm-hmm. And so the devil's allowed to do all these terrible, terrible things to Job. And it kills his family, and gives him boils and harms him. And, and so at the end of his tribulations, this is what Job says. And, and the image calls into, you know, immediately calls into mind uh, the nuclear holocaust that they are feeling as an impending, impending immediately, the sort of Damocles, as it were, that, whole, that dangles upon all of the proceedings of this story. Right. And then, after that, mm-hmm. <laughs> there is a reprinted excerpt from the Journal of Ornithology, mm-hmm. the Blood from the Shoulder of Paulus, a palace, uh, by Daniel Dryberg. Now, Pallas is the, uh, it's Athena. Okay. Pallas is her Roman name. Okay. And Athena is the goddess of owls and the hunt and the moon. Okay. Um, she is, and this is uh, important, uh, a virgin. Okay. So she is the virgin hunter. That's what her, that's like her, uh, her uh, yeah, sort of idiom. That's what okay. she is. And so this whole article, I, I try, I've been trying to read this thing like, I've tried to read this thing a hundred times. I can't get through it because it's so, it's so much like, uh, it's just so, yeah, I was about it's like to... a whole run long rambling beginning. That's almost like, could you say something or do something? It's like talking about the story. It's like, can you, can you appreciate a bird? If you have studied I, I the bird, I thought it was just me. I, I thought it was just me because I mean, I, I've, I think I've glossed, I may have, may have read over it once, but as many times I've read this, um, this graphic novel, I've glossed over it each time it comes to this, to this point. But um, I'm just noticing that he does mention Max Ernst again, that one mm-hmm. panel that we've seen um, in that montage um, from, I, I get one of the, um, I think page 16 or what have you, um, we can always reference that back. But that was a, that's the missing writer that he's mentioned. Yes. That. And he's talking about the old owl screaming deranged and he p- picks up, you know, the old owl is hunting again, I think is what he's kind of saying too. But it, like I said, Dryberg's style of writing is is intentionally like mm-hmm. wordy and contemplative, and you know, just uh, it's hard to it's a hard read. It's, it sa- it sure. says a lot about his character. Um, when we're talking about you know geeks, nerds, or what have you, we tend to be a lot more analytical. If 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 you want to say a lot more, um, you know, into what we're into. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and a lot more detailed, um, and to the point where stuff that we say may go over someone's head, you know, um, when, when Scott was talking about, you know, uh, uh, Dryberg talking about, you know, a certain subject and then she's just like, shh. (laughs) <laughs> you know, she just like cuts them off and everything. You know, this everyone is everyone tells me to shut up when yeah, I talk I about mean, birds. It, it, shut it, up it, about your birds. Who 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 is a nerd is, has has not been through you know certain things where we want, may want to talk about comic books. We may want to talk about things. Um, and this was really prevalent back in the eighties. You know, mm-hmm. you had to be really if if you weren't into like the regular manly rocky you know arnold schwarzenegger type you know, um, and you were into like you know uh, 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 stuff like this. And you were really into it to a point where, you know, Dan is just writing stuff and just like Scott said, rambling, then, you know, it's, 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 he's writing things here that just straight goes over your head. It went over mine, you know, for the most part. So what he says here is that like when you stare, when you study something intricately enough, you lose, you lose track of what makes it interesting. Yeah. So when you dissect it, when you hash something out to its little minute details, you lose track of the artisticness of it. And so what he says is. I was stay, you know, I was looking and I, I talk about all these little minute measurements of the the foil, the, the, the feathers mm-hmm. and the you know the the eyes and everything. Mm-hmm. But he was in a parking lot and he just heard this, you know, this 
scream, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The scream of this owl, and it it scared him, and it made him feel an emotion. Mm -hmm. And it made him reconsider his minute parsing outlook on everything. Right. Um, And so so that's that's kind of the gist of this. But it's written in such a way that it's so boring. Such a boring. Yeah, and, 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 and it's probably purposely done by Alan Moore, you know, to do that because it really oh, yeah. says a lot about his character. You know, oh, it, yeah. bring, it brings a lot. Okay, well, you know, Dan, without the costume adventuring, he's not the most interesting. I mean, I mean, he may be interesting to other nerds or geeks or what have you, but to like other the, bird nerds. <laughs> right, exactly. But <laughs> to like the casual, you know, a quote unquote normal folks or whatever, you know, he's, he's, he's not that interesting. You know, yeah, yeah, and it, and it's something you know. It's it's important to remember that at the time the media was created here in '85, there was not the Marvel universe and the DC universe, and there had not even been a Tim Burton's Batman yet. Right. And so the only superhero media that had gone popular essentially was the Superman movie, right, in like '80 and '76, and like the Batman television show. Mm-hmm. And so there wasn't like. Like, you see, all the kids these days are wearing, like, Iron Man stuff and Captain America stuff. And right. Like, that stuff was niche in the 80s. It, it was it, an it, outsider it, sort of it, situation. For all our younger listeners, believe me, it was a time. <laughs> Thank God for, for the younger listeners who had parents that were into, you know, to that type of stuff. And that mm-hmm. brought you guys into this world and everything. And, you know, now it's, it's just a norm where, you know. Um, like Scott was saying, you have uh, kids wearing Iron Man and, you know, into um, making YouTube videos about um, um, trailer reactions and stuff and everything. Mm-hmm. Stuff our parents would have never uh, fandom, you know, anything um, like that, like, 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 you know, like um, like younger folks doing and everything. You've you got to be thankful for them bringing you into this world, because back then it was not like that at all. You were looked upon as like a, a just ugly. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, back in 1985, if you were even to touch that type of stuff, and it was just a very um, go back and watch Revenge of the Nerds, parts one, two, and three. Watch Revenge of the Nerds. Watch you know any any Schwarzenegger movie from the 80s. Right. Watch any Stallone movie from right. the 80s. There was this like bicepy, murderous, like club. stupid, <laughs> not you know what I mean, like just mm-hmm. flat you know, flashy, muscular, like that's what it was. That's That's what what media was was back then. And the top two movies in domestic boss office in 2018 were Black Panther Mm -hmm. and Avengers Mm three. They both made like $700 million. Like it's, 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 so things have changed a lot since then. So like this sort of otherness that sort of incumbent in comic book fandom isn't something that you feel as much now. And it's something that Dan feels Yes, because he's into something Mm -hmm. that's as niche Right and disinteresting to the uh, uninitiated as comic books would have been to the forty-year-old man who was really into him in nineteen eighty-five. Dan is very represent re- representative of uh, what the um, I guess the comic book geek back what that was back back in the eighties. You know, he, yes, he represents a um, um, and this and like Scott said, this was written in a, in the um, in a different time and everything. But it's a great history lesson for those. Mm-hmm. Who who are maybe going through something right now because it's still relative today, you know. Mm-hmm. If you're into something that nobody else is really into, um, it's it doesn't matter whether it's birds, comic books, you know, um, uh, anything. You know, if you're really into it, um, it really says a lot about how um, you can still really be a part of the world and be what you're into, you know, at this point in time and everything that makes sense. yes absolutely <laughs> absolutely so that so that's the first part of the night owl series here from these limited series and that's sort of the structure right mm-hmm. you get you know two issues one two issues about it, sort of focus on each main character and uh this is the sort of the second night owl the, the first night owl i'm sorry first mm-hmm. one um so it's very interesting you know a lot of uh, a lot of really it's kind of neat i think little little hints here uh i i think that bringing this sort of like mature and I mean, like adult, like not adult, but adult uh-huh. look at sexual activity in a comic book is is something that you don't find anywhere else. No, I mean, like I say, each chapter we go through, we're finding things that, um, you know, if you're reading like, um, especially during that time in '85 when you were reading like the average superhero book, it was tropey, tropey, just tropey. You know, things that you've seen and um, told in many different fashions, different, you know, size and everything, but still the same old type. Okay. Um, A happens here, B happens here, and then C happens here, you know, origin, you know, 
a superhero goes through certain, you know, stuff, you know, a trial, and then all of a sudden, you know, the world is good. He um, saves a day and the end and everything. Mm -hmm. Watchmen goes through so many layers, complications, and nuances that it um, makes you definitely appreciate the fact that it's telling a um an adult type story in um in a um in a superhero type fashion you know mm -hmm. this is what it would be you know if superheroes were actually real or mask adventures because manhattan is really the only superhero if right. um you know heroes were actually you know here in the, um in the real world yes they would age and they would fall apart and they're doing that. They have flaws. They have, um, uh, uh, you know, impudence and everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they go through their um, their their um, younger stages and the grown up stages and everything, and they grow. You know, I, I think this chapter really says a lot about the growth of Dan and Lori from the time that they they stopped adventuring to the time of uh, where they are right now when they put back on the costumes of how much they've grown since then. So that's a, a really important element to keep in mind. And that'll take hold in, you know, as far as the rest of the story, too. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see you're going to see a very different Dan Dryberg after this. Yes. I, I think that's one thing you can definitely say is that this this experience that he's had has made him, you know, like think about how in the Keen Acts when he's with the comedian, he's sort of mm -hmm. just the comedian's car. Mm hmm. Right, he gets the comedian over there, and he says, "Oh, well, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do?" And the, he doesn't have a plan. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we're gonna see from Dan moving forward is that he's gonna be uh, actively planning and doing things as opposed to being passive, active, assertive, uh, more aggressive. He's found his purpose. Like, 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 um, um, me and Scott were saying, you know, he's in that one panel. And he's in the sky controlling the um the ship and everything, and he's just smiling. He's in his world. Smiling. He's found his ear to ear. He's found his purpose and everything. And what a great joy to anyone in life when they find their purpose and actually mm -hmm. is able to let go all their inhibitions and everything and just go and just be free and everything. You know, it's it just says a lot about a person and how they walk forward after that. You know, everyone you know wants it to get to that point of when they're actually free. Perfect. And I guess that's where we end it. Um, that's and, a great and, spot. And, and, and the blood just keeps coming down on the clock, guys. It's yep. Escalation. It's coming. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, we, hey, we really appreciate you sticking with us today. Yeah. We know, you know, uh, hey, we earned the PG-13 today, I think. But like, like we said earlier, <laughs> it's not us as much as it is the, the story we're telling you about. Uh, it's really a – it should not be – it should be rated R. It is, you know, it is what it is. Such a fantastic story. Please uh, look us up on Facebook. Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen are on our Facebook group. Send us feedback at Watching Watchmen and Nerd Cyclopedia. Uh, follow us on Twitter at um, uh, Watch and Watchmen Podcast One because we couldn't <laughs> afford the tea. No tea. <laughs> and also um, at a regular um, um, Twitter at Nerd Cyclopedia. Uh, we have a new Instagram account, you know, Nerd Ooh. Cyclopedia. So um, Instagram, and of course. We're uh, listen to us wherever your favorite podcasts are. You know, um, as Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen. Amp, check us out. We're definitely on iTunes as always. You know, reviews really help us. Yes. If you like the show a lot, drop us a five star review. If you don't like the show that much, drop us a five star review. Uh, and remember, if you don't give us five stars, I reserve the right to personally give you the business. He sure will. See you guys. See you.